So accidental canon and other lessons. Oh, another quick note. I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. I have made a number of comments in this conference uh, in my uh, role or from my experience at the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, but in this talk, I'm wearing one of my other hats, uh, that of a longtime uh, free culture volunteer. Okay, so this has nothing to do with my work at the foundation. All right. <clears throat> So accidental canon and other lessons from building digital libraries. Um, you already know this. I'm a Saf Botov, um, and I'm a Wikipedian since 2001 um, on the English Wikipedia, which was the only one at the time. And uh, once the Hebrew Wikipedia was started in 2003, I mostly switched to working there. I'm also a software engineer uh, by training, um, and so I've been putting my skills to use in hacking free software for the public good. <clears throat> my native language is Hebrew. I grew up in Israel. And so I'm also, does anyone know this? Yes, the famous Archimboldo uh, picture of the librarian. Uh, I don't know if you can see this from afar, but he's entirely made of books. And that was me when I was growing up. Um, I'm also an accidental librarian. I have no formal training in library science, but through a series of accidents, I have become a librarian. So this started in a galaxy far, far away, uh, Israel, uh, back in 1999, before Wikipedia. Does everyone remember a time before Wikipedia? <laughs> Some of you are young. Uh, yes, before Wikipedia, um, I, oh no, resolution issues. Okay, before Wikipedia, I made some stone soup. Who knows the story about the stone soup? Very few people. I will have to tell it very briefly. A uh, wayfarer reaches a village. He's famished, he's hungry. Um, he is knocking on doors asking for food. Nobody would, would give him any food. So <clears throat> despair, uh, desperate, he sits down in the village square with, a, with an old pot that he carried with him and puts a big rock in the middle of the pot and starts heating up water. Uh, the curious villagers wander by and go, what, what, what do you have there? And he goes, oh, I'm making stone soup, it's delicious. And they've never heard of anything, anything like that and they go, stone soup, really? And he goes, oh yeah, it's quite delicious, but you can't have any because you, know, you didn't want to give me any food. Um, and the villagers were so curious, they said, well, maybe, you know. And the wafer said, well, you know what would make it really good is a bit of carrot. If you get me some carrot, I'll let you have some of the soup. The villager goes away and brings back some carrots. Another one comes by, brings back some onions. And of course, before you know it, there is delicious soup for everyone. The wayfarer contributed the stone. So that's what I did. I made some stone soup um, by taking a book that I had from high school of poetry of the national poet, um, the national Hebrew poet, Bialik. And I just started typing the poetry from that book, which was public domain, into my computer, which involved learning how to input those pesky um, diacritics, the little dots above and below uh, letters in Hebrew, which are necessary for poetry. Uh, which I had no use for until then. But anyway, so I typed the, those poems into my computer. I uploaded a bunch of static HTML files to a website. And I wrote at the bottom, this is the stone soup part. I wrote at the bottom, I'm kind of doing this, uploading the poems of the national poet. If you think it's a good idea, email me and we'll split up the work or something. That was how I started, unknowingly, uh, I started my digital library. Turns out a couple of people did think it's a good idea. They did email me, we did share the work, and today we have digitized more than 9,000 works by more than 150 different authors through the labor of almost 1,000 volunteers over the years, uh, and we currently have a steady 200 volunteers who are actively typing and proofreading material in Hebrew, public domain material, and uploading it to the digital library. I'm not really showing you the site because you are Hebrew challenged. <laughs> Through no fault of your own, but you know. All right. Um, this is our youngest volunteer. As you can see, he is scanning an old book in order to 
send those scans to our volunteers to type. He may or may not be my nephew, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, accidents that happened along the way. It's been almost 16 years. The first accident is authority by default. Uh, when George Mallory was asked why he wants to climb the Everest, he said, because it's there. And that is also the answer to why are people using our editions of that poet or that essayist? The answer is because it's there, because it's on the net, findable, not under a paywall, not even behind a registration wall. It's just there. You find it with a simple web search, you click through the web search, and you're there with the text. That's why people use it. And this taught me that to a large and growing degree, if it's not online, it's out. It won't get used. Of course, there will always be the people who show up here at the National Archive, there at the National Library, serious researchers who have the time and the budget to show up and do the research and request that rare book, etc. But they are, always have been, and will continue to be a tiny minority. For most people, including researchers, and not just lazy students, undergraduates, but also professors, research is happening online. Literary uh, people, people who write essays, people who, who um, are inspired by other, by, by former generations' literature, are doing it online, are consuming it online. So if it's not online, it's as good as not existent. Now, this is where the accident comes in. Our volunteers made decisions like, well, shall we work on this author next or on that author next? And what did we make those decisions, what basis did we make them on? Well, I have a copy of this author. I don't currently have a copy of that author, so I'll work on this author. Not because this is the most urgent work to put online, not because this is more important than that, but uh, you know, it's convenient, it's available, so I'm doing it, I'm a volunteer. So our decisions, which I'm trying to point out, were not made by some scholarly scale of, of uh, importance, affect what is available online, in Hebrew at least. And that, as I said, affects what gets cited what gets included, what gets uh, counted in surveys, in computational linguistics, in all kinds of wide studies that just take a corpus. What is in that corpus is what we happened to have put there, what we happened to have managed to do by 2015, which is of course different from what we will have managed to do by 2016. A study pu published in two years will include different examples, will include better data, uh, will maybe contradict conclusions drawn today. And it would be the difference is controlled by what a bunch of amateur volunteers are doing for their volunteer reasons. It's not just the availability of the material, it's also, I don't know, this guy's really boring. I'll type something else for a while. I mean, um, this authority, this unsought authority, we never wanted it, we never sought to become uh, the only source, we never sought to create um, um, a, a resource that would determine, that would shape research, but we have by accident. This also, uh, interestingly, gives us authority, personal authority, that we did not ask for. I and other volunteers on my project regularly get asked questions that should be asked of experts. Not just, you know, do you know when this poem was composed, or what does this footnote here mean, or what does this dedication to RN mean, who is RN? You know, uh, questions that... I should stop doing that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, anyway, 
So we get asked questions that uh, should be asked of experts. Why are we being asked those questions? Because we provided the material. By merely making an e-text available, we have created, for many people, not all, the appearance of authority. People ask me questions that I, A, cannot answer, B, am not the best person to answer, even if I can answer them. I do my best. Uh, if I'm confident of the answer, I provide it. If not, I literally remind people of the existence of encyclopedias, of libraries. I find myself sending people to their local library, their university library, um, and thank you. Ooh, proprietary software. Um, and this authority that is implicit, I put up those works so I must know something about them, is partly due to laziness, right? This is where I found the text. There's an email at the bottom. I'll just shoot an email to this person. And partly it is even because people imagine us to be other than we are. When people meet me in person, they go, oh, I thought you were uh, like a retired professor of Hebrew literature. I have never studied Hebrew literature. I thought you were uh, you know, a member of the Hebrew Language Academy. Well, why did you think that? I don't know. You, you, know, you produced a digital edition of the National Poet. You, we kind of assume that's the kind of person who would do that. So, no. so um, I just thought it was interesting the, the way authority happened to me uh, without ever claiming any kind of authority on the text. In fact, if you do bother to click the About page, we say that we're a bunch of volunteers and we're doing this and it's public domain and stuff. But anyway, um, the final point about the authority is the our project, being volunteer labor, has typos, mistakes. Our volunteers occasionally skip a line, you know, when they're copying from, from the source, and sometimes our proofreaders don't catch that. In really bad cases, sometimes the pages on the original book were maybe kind of stuck together and someone didn't notice it, and a whole two pages are skipped. That happens. It happens in professional digitization efforts as well. It happens on our project. Um, do those omissions and typos make users, particularly scholars, go, oh, this isn't good enough. I guess I'll have to get up off my chair and go to the library. Or would they use it anyway? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> well, some of them, anyway. My second lesson uh, off that I want to offer you is the accidental uh, no. Not this either. Yes, the accidental Canon 1N. Um, for those who don't know, Canon comes from Hebrew, from Kane, meaning read. It's in the book of Ezekiel. You shall build a house, six cubits, blah, 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 with a measuring reed. So this is the measuring reed here in, an, in a painting from the tomb of the Egyptian Menach, who was a scribe. They had respect for people uh, back then. So he was a scribe of the pharaoh, and he got wall paintings on his tomb, which is more than you can say for most scribes today. Um, anyway, the canon, uh, from the sense of measuring reed, uh, comes the sense of a corpus of works, a body of works that you measure other things by. This is the canon. This is the good stuff. The rest either measures up or doesn't, etc. Just making sure everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say the canon. And uh, our project is a library. The library tries to be comprehensive. It's not a selection. It's not a, an exhibition of the best works of Hebrew literature. It's a library. And it's digital. So we don't have space concerns. So we want all of it, all of Hebrew literature, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We want poetry and prose, but we also want essays and reference books and outdated dictionaries. We want it all. And we want it the way it is, including you know, outdated politics, misogyny, whatever Hebrew literature, like other literatures contained, belongs 
in the library. So we're not building a canon. We're building a complete library. But, uh, and of course, we're, we're no more than maybe 10% there in covering all of Hebrew literature. Uh, and yet, if you give people enough of the canon, the perceived canon, right? I said we have the national poet, we have like the, the second most important poet, we have the greatest essayist and prose stylist in Hebrew, we have the first Hebrew novel. We have a lot of those street name authors, you know, authors you know from like the streets in your city, perhaps more than from reading them. So we have what is considered the canon, parts of the canon of Hebrew literature, and because of that, um, the rest of the canon is assumed. People see these three, four, five, seventeen canonical names, and they go, oh, this site contains all the canon. Except it doesn't, of course. Partly because we haven't gotten to it, partly because some of it is still copyrighted. We're not allowed to offer it. Doesn't stop people from assuming you're offering them the canon. And this assumption, again, feeds into scholarship. If you feel that this site and searching this site will give you all the uses of a certain word or a certain biblical verse in canonical Hebrew literature, you will report this in your study and you would, of course, be wrong. People do this all the time. I have very little ability to prevent them. What I can do is just cover more and more of the literature. Um, Another aspect of this is that people are clamoring for what they perceive to be missing pieces of the canon. Occasionally, I mean, uh, some of the um, beloved poets uh, in Hebrew are still copyrighted. Hebrew is a young, old language. It's only been revived about 150 years ago, for those who don't know. So some of the major, major poets, modern Hebrew poets, are still copyrighted. Uh, and people are looking at this and automatically feel, wait, you have this, this, and that, but not that guy, why not? Most people forget or don't know enough about copyright to even think of that reason. Some of them write me angry letters, like you have excluded a very important poet. Uh, and then I have to remind them about copyright. Um, even more interesting, I think, is that because we are comprehensive, we include a lot of what wouldn't be considered canonical, by most Hebrew readers and scholars, but we include it because remember, we are a library, we're not building a canon. And non-canonical pieces are either tolerated or even mistaken for canon, because again, they're on that pedestal with all the greats. And then there's a name we kind of haven't heard of, but he must be canonical, he must be part of the canon, because he's in this site, which people mistake to be a site about the canon. Of course, this will decrease, I suppose, the more we cover, the more obvious it is that most of the names there are not canonical. A subversive question, will those works remain non-canon now that they're on a level playing field with the canonical works, now that they're just as discoverable, they're just as reusable, they're not uh, subject to market forces that drive them out of availability, would people rediscover some of those works? Would uh, a very popular blogger quoting some forgotten poet give it new life? Maybe. I hope so. I think that's healthy. I think that's good. All right. So that was the accidental canon. <clears throat> and I'm also uh, an accidental publisher, full of accidents. I'm clumsy. Um, so a lot of literary work, this is the case everywhere, is scattered across literary journals, supplements of daily newspapers, uh, pamphlets and one-offs. Uh, that's how most uh, literary people make a living, right? Is by contributing, by contributing um, their work to periodicals. Um, we have become the first publisher of previously uncollected works, works that were published, but were, you know, in the 1937 edition of the whatever, the equivalent of the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, some, of the, some of them were digitized by our National Library, 
But, you know, they were available in like a digitized archive PDF complicated thing that gives you the page and then the rest of the article is on the other page. And it's all like a PDF that you can or cannot download and it depends. We have collected those pieces and are offering them together uh, for the first time. This too has implications for discoverability and reuse. Um, some literary estates, works by people who have died, are languishing because they're not commercial, because there's no one to publish them. We have become the first publisher of some really old works that have just never found a publisher. Works by published authors, by, by serious authors, um, that we have published for the first time 70, 80, 100 years after they were written, available for the first time to a reading public through our site. Uh, I am also an accidental literary liberator. Um, <clears throat> the, does anyone know Mr. Ranganathan? Yes, librarians in the audience. Uh, the five rules of, of the library. Books are for use and copyright law and the market forces, on the other hand, mean that vast sections of the literature, especially Hebrew literature, which again is young, are languishing between copyright and non-commercial viability. Uh, this creates a disjointed literary tradition where there's like a myopic piece between the present, what we see in bookstores and read about, and the far past. All of that mid-20th century stuff is inaccessible, invisible, and we are addressing that by securing permission, which is hard. We're tracking down heirs, we're tracing family trees. I'm also an accidental genealogist. Um, to get permission to publish those books before copyright expires, sometimes 40, 50 years before they would have become public domain, they are already available on our site. For example, the writings of David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel who wrote a whole bookshelf of books. Um, he died in 1974, wouldn't have been public domain for decades, are available on our site with permission. Uh, one might argue that this would have been something of a national agenda, that other actors might have uh, taken it upon themselves, but they don't, so we do. Finally, I've discovered I'm an accidental librarian because as the library grows, um, it needs a catalog. And um, my library is born digital. It only has files, texts. It doesn't have books at all. And it's different. It means I don't have millions of mark records of legacy data. It also means we catalog works, not volumes, not books. A single four-line poem is a unit in our catalog. And a three-volume novel is also one unit in our catalog. Um, this opens, I hope librarians in the audience realize this, this opens a world of modern possibilities, Ferber, all the rest of it, um, allowing us to contribute to and to benefit from the linked open data cloud, which has been discussed elsewhere, so I won't go into it. We are a little behind on implementation, but we should be actively contributing very soon. And finally, some specific wiki connections. Uh, of course, much reuse is already happening. Reuse of our text is happening on Wikipedia, which refers to essays and works in our collection. And the key is that they're just, you just, it's just a link. You don't have to get past any registration or any process. Um, this reuse, of course, drives other reuse, a point that has been made in some other sessions. If Wikipedia links to your stuff, other people will discover it through Wikipedia and then f reuse it as well on their own in other ways. Um, Wikidata is, of course, the natural locus for interoperability and, and discovery of, uh, of material. And I think I'm out of time, but I'll just tease you with a couple of uh, possibilities for the future. What if we not just enrich metadata through linked data, but the text themselves? My full text literary works could optionally, if the reader wants it, be automatically annotated with links to Wikipedia, Wikidata, something else, for people names, for place names, for concepts. Uh, this is not far from uh, reality. And one of my favorite ideas, 
massively multiplayer online bibliography. Uh, what if we use the power of crowdsourcing and volunteers, which I have, to create, to do uh, uh, long-term bibliographic grunt work like creating tables of contents of stuff, like anthologies, like magazines that are, many of which, especially in Hebrew, are not yet very well uh, indexed and cataloged. What if we do that? What if we have entities, linked data entities, for every single article or essay in every single anthology? I'm not talking about scholarly journals, which are already fairly well indexed. I'm talking about literary essays. I'm talking about short stories. What if we had a table of contents of everything? That's a plan, a scheme, an evil plan I'm working on. And what if, we, um, what if we had an aboutness project? What if we had a way to assert what every work, including that four-line poem, is about, right? By linking it, if it's a poem about spring, we link it to the Wikidata entity, spring. If it's a poem about Ben-Gurion, we link it to Wikidata about Ben-Gurion, and then we can query. We can say, give me all the poems that are about spring and Holland. Um, if, if that exists in Holland, I don't know. All right, thanks, thanks for listening. <laughs>